This vision was more vivid and intense than what I experienced on my last case. This villain has killed before. They will not stop. They enjoy the pattern and they enjoy the game. I felt what the latest victim felt. I saw what he saw. A pursuit that started in the present, ended in the past, at a place that resembled the dead end where Andrew Chapman died last night. Show yourself. This brick is hand-painted. I need to collect all I can find and see how they relate to Chapman's murder. Chapman was a widower. His ring is missing. It isn't in the box and it wasn't on the body. This program was paused after the killing and after the forensics team went over the home and crime scene. And channel 187 was no accident. That's the police call number for homicide.
the dishwasher was meant to get my attention. It's locked and running the killer's cycle to remove evidence. The hunt is being made into a personal game. A weaver's loom. The killer enjoys the chase and has made it personal. The killer is arrogant. Evidence was put on display and set to be washed clean while I investigated. There is nothing to trace on Chapman's shoe. The killer ate a leisurely meal using the place setting. But the antique plate is all wrong. It looks turn of the century and does not fit with any of Andy Chapman's belongings.
The killer is playing games. A black light was put in the street light. The lab team has no idea about the invisible ink. The outline of the body was made by the killer in the invisible ink. The killer covets where the victim died and may have specifically positioned the body. The arms are in the 8 o'clock position. Today is the 8th. Maybe the number is important, maybe not. This woman has wounds nearly identical to those found on Andrew Chapman's body, but her shredded clothes are from a hundred years ago. The bodies fell or were positioned the same way. No signs of a struggle. The killer either surprised him or was never perceived as a threat. The impression on her finger indicates that she wore a ring. It's missing, but her purse is here. was that poor woman. I saw her last moments and felt what she did. The end was sudden. She did not see the killer. Her scream was silenced by a male's left hand covered in a leather glove. The killer said nothing but his mouth was open. His breath came slightly down on her. Judging by her height, the killer could not have been tall. I'm going to explore the neighborhood and learn this woman's name. It fits, and a bootmaker would have interest in the victim's missing footwear. Knock, knock.
If I find solid proof that John Pizer is the killer, he won't get far. the victim's missing boot. It proves Pizer was at the crime scene and did not inform the police. Blood. I sensed she smelled the leather of the glove that covered her mouth, but not a heavier scent like the hide used in soles or boot polish. Mr. Pizer may have been trying to steal a pair of shoes to sell in his shop, but had to flee before he could finish for fear of being linked to the murder. I can learn more about the victim if I track where she began her walk. Which tracks do I follow?
Kaiser definitely made a path to the victim. He saw her, but did he kill her? There's no doubt about it. The victim connects with this building. She might live here.
The killer is playing cat and mouse with a person of authority in this time period. Is the murderer of Andrew Chapman a present-day copycat? I hear deliberate noises. I am not alone. Someone else was here. That isn't her bite mark. Since when does a woman have mustache hairs? Wonder what ailed her, and where she got this brand of Hocus Pocus snake oil. Her ring was not on her body, and it isn't here just like Andrew Chapman. Patient wolf. Good with sharp tools left this here or gave it as a gift. was Annie Chapman.
night grabbed this woman just like Annie Chapman. She felt the hairs of a mustache on her neck. I believe the same predator murdered both women. That mark on the throat. Her locket is missing and she wants it back. Maybe it will lead to her identity. curious about these overcoats, but I can't just rifle through them all. Evidence will give me probable cause to search the right one. Victims of a serial killer. I see Martha Tabram and the unnamed victim. Annie Chapman is marked as the next victim. When I find the missing name, I bet the pattern is the same in Chicago. Someone who works here would be a great suspect. They know the area, make the kill, and admire their handiwork at their leisure when the body is brought in for examination. Mustache hair on the food. Not charming, but interesting if it came from someone the killer's height. Come to see the boss? Down the hall. If I were you, I'd keep my nose out of other folks' affairs. Boss? Someone called Boss interests me, and so does the person who said it. Thank you. 
interesting character, John Druitt. Even in his chosen portrait, he looks depressed. Judging by his classroom, he has a background in anatomy, and there's no disguising that mustache. London with the East End neighborhood detailed out. Druitt knows his way around. A doctor has committed his mother for depression and paranoid delusions. Druid keeps this note near him. Does the diagnosis run in the family? A gift not given. Or was it returned? This is expensive. Druid has money. Tabram? A Marty Tabram died of stab wounds in Cicero on April 7th. The case wasn't connected to Andrew Chapman's because one was female, the other male. Coincidence? Two victims from the 19th century died on the same days as two victims in the present with the same last names. The name of the victim by the fence may confirm my suspicions. The mortuary assistant, Robert Mann, is the same man I met in the school foyer. I see possibilities that would bring a mortuary assistant together with a headmaster interested in anatomy. The JP mark on these shoes tells me that Druid was a customer of bootmaker John Pizer. I wonder where these shoes have been. Said the spider to the fly. John Pizer is interesting me again as a suspect. If he had shine stations around the city, he knew the area and its people very well. This one was in proximity to the first victim.
Of course. The desks are arranged like September 1888, and two days have importance, the 8th and the 30th. And on September 8th, 1888, Annie Chapman was the victim. And on September 30th, the killer promises to strike again. I'm curious about these overcoats. The locket portrait is school headmaster Montague John Druitt. Perhaps the women were secret rivals and public friends. Annie picked up the killer's coins before the authorities could discover them. And she removed Druitt's picture from the locket because she believed he could have been the killer.
interesting character, John Druitt. curious about these overcoats, but I can't just rifle through them all. The charcoal gray thread is woolen, and that discoloration is unmistakably blood. Were the slide and thread mistakes by the killer, or convenient plants? I'm going to follow the evidence and look for a charcoal gray wool coat. Mr. Robert Mann. Mortuary assistant, wearing a woolen, charcoal gray coat fashion statement. Good to see you again this evening, Mr. Mann. Thank you for your assistance in directing me to Headmaster Druitt. Robert Mann became the strongest suspect, but is he a careless killer or a guy being set up? If the blood on his coat belongs to the victim, it could be murder or just an accident of his occupation. The victim who died on August 31st is Polly Nichols. Her murder came before Annie Chapman and after Martha Tabram. Tabram and Andrew Chapman fit a serial killer's last name pattern, not Weaver. 
this accident wasn't meant to kill me. I have to find someone named Nichols who died on September 8th. This 40 caliber is standard issue to the Chicago police force. I found the car of missing undercover officer Paul Nichols. He was missing on the same day that Polly Nichols was murdered. I fear the present day Nichols met with a similar fate. I need to find him. I don't like being in the spotlight. Something has to be done about that camera.
The list of suspects compiled by historians includes a man named James Kelly. Is Jimmy Kelly the copycat killer? Or is he just a man who stumbled upon a curious fact from the past? I'm going to get an ebook copy and learn more. Kelly has detail. Is Jimmy Kelly the copycat killer? Or is he just a man who stumbled upon a curious fact from the past? I'm going to get an ebook copy and learn more. These patterns may be significant. Can't rely on memory. recognize these symbols. They're not gang signs. I, I need someone else to take a look. The card is deliberately filled. Murder days and ages of the victims. The evidence is telling me that Paul Nichols is dead. The security cameras would show the killer if Paul Nichols was murdered on August 31st. Nichols, heads you live, tails you die. Paul Nichols is dead. 8.30 sharp. No one on this case dies that early in the evening. 
Chapman died on the 8th. The killer plans to use their sharp blade again on September 8th and 30th. The killer has the knowledge to manipulate security systems. Kelly is an obvious suspect. I need a picture of this.
This is the car I want. Samantha, any idea what these symbols are and what they mean? Best, Angelica. To say that I'm surprised to hear from you is an understatement. I'm only getting interference on your end, so take a leap of faith that you're receiving this message. The symbols are ancient Sumerian. The two on the left are the numbers 7 and 31. The third symbol is rare, something like... Blood rejuvenation. I can't be sure about the two that are scratched out. A copycat killer that dabbles in ancient Sumerian text? This implies someone highly educated in a specialized, almost obsessive academic subject. If the killer has the same skills as a suspect in the past, I would rule out bootmaker John Pizer. Headmaster Druitt looks more suspicious, but Robert Mann had access to his library. This bomb could blow a hole in the world. These wires look familiar. They're laid out like the Chicago train lines. 7, 31, and 8 are days when Tabram, Nichols, and Chapman died. Their bodies were located near those spots in the city. Now I know the vicinity where the killer will prowl for a victim today. September 30th. If I'm not too late, Thank you. 
Paul Nichols, an undercover officer deliberately put under the covers by a madman. He was killed the same way as the other victims. Some shreds of clothes gone, ring mark on the finger but no ring. Today is the 30th. A killer is repeating the history of London's slasher from 1888. In Kelly's book, there were two victims on the 30th. I know the vicinity of the attacks. I have a train to catch. I need to check in before continuing the chase. Especially since someone took the trouble to move my car. That brings everyone at the station up to speed on the fate of Paul Nichols and the pattern of the Cicero Slasher. Martha Tabram, who died on August 7th, is only in the history books as a possible victim. But this is the name that started the series in the East End and Cicero. Tabram's murder establishes a serial pattern. Murders are in numerical order at the beginning of the month, and then there is another murder on the last day of the month. Killings continued through November 9th and then stopped. The brutal East End slasher got away. If I can solve the case from 1888, I will have my copycat in the present. The trick is getting there first. Two people died on this date. The first will be in less than an hour. There are several listings for Stride in the neighborhood, but none for Eddowes or any variant of that last name. I've sent out a bulletin to cover the Strides, but I'll take Beth's Stride. She has a store and residence just a train stop away. Usually there are pieces missing. This time, I'm given one. The killer wants to play. Someone wants me to take the train. Okay, I'll take the train. Someone wants me to take the train. Okay, I'll take the train. The killer left me a message. Nice to know I'm going... The killer left me a message. Nice to know I'm going...
This is a map of London's East End. It looks similar to the section of town where the current murders are taking place. No wonder the killer chose Chicago Cicero to prowl. So there's a John Druitt within this time period who the police like for the murders. A doctor, skilled with knives. It doesn't feel right. This guy is a family man and not a loner. I have all 30 fabric pieces. It just turned into my job to get this train to the next stop and check on Beth Stride. Time ran out for stride. I need to get off this train in a hurry. A lifeless mannequin. Is the killer trying to tell me that stride is lifeless, or is the message that there is something fake about this next victim? A lifeless mannequin.
It's Elizabeth Stride, but the M.O. is wrong. The smells of the killer are different, and there is only one wound. I can feel the blade. It's a different murder weapon. History got this murder wrong. Elizabeth Stride was killed by someone else. I am looking for a methodical killer who targets one victim on specific days. Tonight's real target is Catherine Eddowes. Miter Square. <laughs> it's the body of Catherine Eddowes. As the killer hinted, she died earlier than history told us. I can't read her thoughts in the commotion. The wounds were made by the same killer, but there are more of them. The brutality is showing more arrogance. Only the ring was removed, probably as a trophy. There are scents on the killer I can't identify. Not quite medicinal. Edward Doe's. Ed Doe's. Edos. The history books say that Mary Jane Kelly was the final victim of the East End Slasher. Supposedly the killing stopped after her. This could be my last chance. Who's Drake? The murders that took place in London's East End and now in Cicero are subsets of longer killing sprees. Drake was never listed by slasher experts. Catherine Eddowes was number 16? That means there were 12 murders before the killer set up shop on the East End. The killer knows all the listings for Kelly in this city can't be protected even with the aid of neighborhood watch groups. Mary Jane Kelly was the last victim of the East End Slasher of 1888. Staking out the apartment of the Mary Jane Kelly of my time is the most logical place for me to be. Even if this Kelly isn't the target, the killer knows this is where I would set up camp. pursuing someone who flew over that fence. This barrel can be moved around and set up directly under that fire escape.
Pigeon is someone who is easily deceived. I hope the killer doesn't think I'm that gullible. This is the same snake oil herbal remedy that I found in Annie Chapman's room in 1888.
That alarm is covering up any noises made by the person I'm chasing. I have to find the key to turn it off. If the killer is still playing cat and mouse with me, I must be the last victim, not Kelly. There has to be 20 names to collect.
A lot of the names are Irish or Scottish descent. The East End Slasher may have prowled areas other than London with large heritage populations, like Ireland. Or New York. That manhole cover was put on in a hurry. Somehow the killer scurried under the car and went down. The car was lifted so the killer could get under. Then the jack was kicked out and the crank was taken down the hole. I've got all 20 names. This will keep the station and DA busy. Northbound. A plague just got away. Michael. Kelly, of course. His name wasn't on the police watch list. Someone knew his timetable from another neighborhood. There was no struggle. But how do you sneak up on someone in here? He was killed by someone he knew, or trusted, or didn't perceive as a threat. Someone posing as a workman, a police officer, a doctor, what? You were Mary Jane Kelly, who history says was the last victim of the East End Slasher. And you are in pain, wandering. The killer took his time. He spoke to you. Someone will pay a price on November 30th. The killer is an American. He did not say the date in an Englishman's order with the day first. If an American with a little money stayed in the East End for four months, they needed to stay in a lodge. The killer took her ring and two pieces to her dress. She wants them back before she can rest. This is the only letter from America. It is addressed to Mr. Francis J. Tumblety, who rather fancies himself to be a doctor.
Tumble T is dressed like a man whose ego is out of control. His mustache would leave a trail of loose hairs. Your handwriting looks very familiar, boss. I see you use an alias. On one note, you signed as Francis Tumblety. The other is Frank Townsend. Your handwriting looks very familiar, boss. I see you use an alias. With all the other related bottles in this room, I'd say this is the source. Annie Chapman got her snake oil from this quack Francis Tumblety. has something to do with some type of Sumerian ritual. The missing pieces look like the dress pieces Mary Jane Kelly wants returned. Do I put the pieces in this quilt and further the case? Or satisfy Mary Jane's wishes? I feel compelled to give her what she wants. The killer took her ring and two pieces to her dress. She wants them back before she can rest. The killer took her ring. I did the right thing. Now that Mary knows about Tumblety, she wants me to catch him. She is giving me the dress pieces I found, as well as a third the killer tried to get. I'm going back to Tumblety's room and see how they fit that quilt. always bothered me. It feels like a riddle. I know that Francis Tumblety of the past hated John Druitt for taking some of his spotlight. I suspect nothing has changed in the present, even more since this Druitt is a licensed doctor. In a fit of anger, part of the plan was revealed. Druitt, not Kelly, is going to die by the river. 
It has to happen on November 30th, and his office happens to be near the river on Green Street. I can remove those ropes one at a time. If I get the right sequence, I'll knock the tarp off all four hooks and capture the killer. Francis Townsend, I presume. A direct descendant of Frances Tumblety. She kept the alias he used when fleeing the East End to live in New York and Missouri. The murder weapon. The killer won't be able to slash away to freedom this time. I don't need to wait a while longer. I have the murder weapon and I have you, boss.